I showed you what a scarf was. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball today. We are looking back at the five games from Tuesday. We are previewing a big 11-game slate as well for Wednesday. Michael Bolton. Let's get to it. it. Let's get to it indeed. Let's start with the first game of the night with the Philadelphia 76ers changing up their starting lineup and getting the big win at home against the Clippers, 110-103. The fun guy, Kawhi Leonard, returned. He had 30 points with nine assists, one steal, and two blocks. I'm a fun guy. (laughs) Well, Landry Shamit also shot well against, um, if my voice would work, against his former team. 19 points with five triples. He didn't do anything else. He shot 64% and played a lot of minutes. In this one, well, Marcus Morris, 13-5 and five with three triples. Again, Morris, a 12-team drop, in my opinion. Paul George couldn't hit anything. 11 points on 15 shots, but did have 12 boards, while Lou Williams' production remains down 13-2-6. On 33% shooting, he is better than that, but he's also not going to be as good as he was at the start of the season. A lot of you asking about what the hell to do with Montrez Harrell. Over the last 20 games, he's the 182nd ranked player. Now, a lot of that is to do with his poor free throw percentage, but as I've banged on about time and time again, his defense is bad, right? And the Clippers should be giving more minutes to Ivica Zubats, and he played 20 here. But now that they've got Marcus Morris, who they're going to play at center... I really worry about what this means for Harold. I don't think he can be a top 100 guy the rest of the way. In a 10-team league, I've got no problem with moving on from Harold. And in a 12, I reckon it's moving in that direction. Zubats had 7 and 8 and blocked 2 shots. And if Zubats played 26 minutes a night, this actually might make this team better than what they currently are. On to the Philadelphia 76ers. And as I mentioned, they did change their starting lineup. Al Horford came off the bench for the first time since his rookie season. Only 28 minutes for Horford, 9 and 6 with 2 blocks. Um, does that make him a drop? It's pretty close. I think in in eights, you drop him. In tens, you probably get close to that as well. I'd hold a little bit in 12-team leagues, but it does depend on who else is out there that you want to add. They also push Josh Richardson back into the starting lineup. His minutes restriction over. 21 points for Richo, three triples, five rebounds, and two blocks. Really good usage, good efficiency. Now, we can't rely upon all of that from Richardson, but it's a good sign. He still is a 12-team hold. I'm still not com- entirely convinced with him in shallower formats, but maybe the Horford move helps him. To move Horford out of the starting lineup, they put Ferky from Turkey in there. And I could not have banged on stronger about Korkmaz saying he would not be able to continue back-to-back 30-point games with 70% shooting. He had zero points on 0-5 shooting. He did absolutely nothing else. And it's the age-old adage of this show. And you hear me talk about it all the time. When your game is based on scoring and really efficient shooting and nothing else, when the shot goes away, you offer nothing. Now, this is the extreme example of nothing. Tony Snell says hi. Hi. But that's why Korkmaz was not that must-add player. A lot of people, man, Korkmaz, he's going to take me to a championship, even before the starting lineup change. Guys, there was never a chance of that happening, of him being able to maintain that level. In fact, he didn't even start the second half with this squad. The little dog Glenn Robinson did. You're going to have guys like the painter Matisse Thibel. You're going to have Glenn Robinson. You're going to have Burks. You're going to have Korkmaz play those minutes. And it means yeah, they're just streamer-type options. Thibel had a triple one. That's If you want defense, you can add him. If you want a shot at a guy hitting threes, then Korkmaz can be it. But just go back to literally earlier this season when Richardson was out and Korkmaz started. He did nothing. So we had this two-game run and everyone lost their shit about it. um, And it just wasn't likely to stick. Now, let's talk about the big games because Benny Simmons was great. 26, 12, and 10, as was Joel Embiid, 26 and 9. Both of those guys responding to all the criticism, especially Embiid with all the boos coming down on him from his home crowd. Really big games from both of those guys. Well, Toby Harris... Much better as a four. 17 and 12 in 37 minutes with five assists. And this also takes me but you know, to Sacramento to talk about the pencil, Harris and Barnes. Barnesy. And I shit on Barnes all the time, but he is a power forward in the NBA. And when he has played at power forward the last few games, when he's had to be at power forward and be elites is at center, he's played much better. Toby Harris goes back to his natural position. He plays much better. 
Burks, two points in 14 minutes, 12 team, 14 team drop. Robinson, 12 minutes despite starting the second half, 12 team drop. Korkmaz, not a 12 team league guy either. Um, yeah, so some really interesting changes there in Philadelphia with that rotation. Let's move on now to the next game of the day, and it is your mates, the Chicago Bulls. I've got some things to say about this shit franchise. So the Bulls go down 126 to 114. Um, Jim Boylan is not an NBA head coach. He's not even close to an NBA head coach. If I was an NBA head coach, I'd barely let him wipe my ass, let alone be in charge. He just makes bad decision after bad decision after worse decision. And then today, even after the game, he was asked by multiple reporters, why didn't you play Dan Gafford? who was listed as probable with an, uh, an active with an ankle sprain, the same as last game. And at first he said, I didn't play him because his ankle wasn't right. And then he was asked later on and he said, ah, he was available. I just wanted to play. He said, I didn't play him because we've got the two other centers. Now, those two other centers are Chris Felizio, who's a player, and modern day Robert Ory, Luke Cornett. Why? Are those two impediments to playing a young guy who's shown quite a bit, and those guys have shown a quite a bit of absolutely nothing. And then you ask Gafford after the game, are you ready to go? Yeah, I could go out there and play. And then another part of the issue is he goes, oh, I think the issue my ankle was actually hurt is because I tried to play through it. Well, because your dickhead head coach wouldn't call a timeout to get you out of the game. There are just so much wrong with this squad. On the plus side, Zach Levine was great. 41 points, 9 rebounds, 4 assists, 2 steals, and 8 triples. 71% shooting. Really good stuff. The, and how much of this is Levine? How much of this is the Bulls? I don't know. He just he doesn't lead teams to wins, but he puts up really good numbers, and the team would be a disaster without him. And these numbers are great, but what happens when we move forward? He's the ninth-ranked player over the last 20 games, which is amazing. He's been really, really good. And Kobe White had a strong game too. 14, 5, and 7 with 4 steals. He shot 29%. And it does help that Markinen and Porter and Dunn and Carter and Valentine, all those guys are out. And I'm not looking at him as a 12-team ad, but that was encouraging. It was good from Sadoransky as well, 19-2-8. He's played, been underplayed all season. While Thad Young is really just a, a back-end 12-team league guy, even with Markinen gone. 10-5 and five with two blocks and a steal for Thad there. Uh, as for the two centers that are high priority, 8-7 and seven for Cornet, 2-7 and seven for Felicio, while Chandler Hutchison struggled 9-4. and four. I think there's something in him to be maybe a 7th or 8th man, Hutchison. He's absolutely not a starter, and he's not a must-roster 12-team league guy by any stretch. On to the Wizards. Rui Hachimura, 32 minutes. Now, Scott Brooks, another guy that I've had pretty, plenty of issues with in terms of coaching and communication before the game. It's a back-to-back. -back. Oh, we're going to limit Rui's minutes. We're going to limit Mo Wagner's minutes and then proceeds to play them the most minutes that they've played since coming back from injury. 32 minutes for Hachimura, 20 and 4 with three assists, two steals and two blocks. Prior to this game, if you don't have the stats in front of you, go and have a look at how many blocks Rui Hachimura had before this game. Three. He had three total blocks all season and he blocked two here. So to say that he pulled this one out of his ass would be an understatement. That is a great line. There is no denying that. Great field goal percentage. Elite free throw drawing. Six of six in line. Absolutely fantastic. He's still the 151st ranked player over the course of the season, which makes him not a must-roster 12-team league guy. If you want him, by all means. But that free throw percentage, that efficiency, those steals, those blocks are not real from Hachimura yet. I don't think they ever will be, but they're not real. Ishmith, 10, 5, and 9. He played 28 minutes. While Shabazz Napier, who I, again, think is a better player, had 15, 2, and 2 in only 19 minutes. I think they're just going to be stream, back-end, 12-team league guys who won't be must-roster players. Well, Troy Brown's a clear drop. 16 points, 2 uh, points. He had 5 steals in those 16 minutes, but those minutes just aren't good enough. Like, there's just not enough playing time with everyone healthy. Flaming Mo Wagner. Twenty-seven minutes, twelve points, a steal, and a block. But it looks like Tom Bryant will be back in some capacity straight after the All Star break, uh, which is good. But I don't put full trust in what they're going to do with his minutes and if he's going to be able to survive the rest of the season. Wagner's more of a fourteen-team league guy, while Isaac Bonga is not doing much. Eight points in his twenty minutes. It was also a down game from Bertans, who had ten points in twenty-four minutes. On to the next game, the San Antonio Spurs, the Oklahoma City Thunder. The Spurs are on their rodeo road trip. They win 114-106. DeJounte Murray picked up two early fouls, but still was excellent. 25-9 and nine in 27 minutes. And amazingly, him and Maximum Derek White played together. Maximum Derek. And would you be surprised to know that they played together and the Spurs end up winning? I wouldn't. 17-4-8 for Maximum Derek in 28 minutes. Now, he got into the game early because Murray picked up two quick fouls. But these guys are both good. 
I don't know. I, I don't have trust that they're going to get 30 a night continuously because they're not even getting 30 a night really at any point. And I think a trade for one of them is only going to be the way to open up their absolute value. But it was encouraging here. 25 and 14 for Aldridge. It also helps, of course, that DeMar DeRozan didn't play. The drip, Lonnie Walker. Good steals, again, for the second night in a row. Three steals, but just not much else. Six points, four rebounds. I do worry about his overall fantasy value long-term and what he can do outside of scoring. Uh, and this, again, the last couple of games have been a bit of an illustration of that, although he did have nice assists in the last one. Bryn Forbes, who'd been riding a hot streak, did not do that same thing again. Eight points in 21 minutes for Forbes. Well, we had 31 minutes for Trey Lyles. He blocked four shots, which probably is his uh, season total as well. He has been so up and down in terms of the playing time. It's really hard to rely upon him, but he's not really even close to a top 200 guy. For the Thunder, poor starts from, uh, or poor p- uh, performances in general from the Italian cock, Danilo Gallinari. Hands off my cock! And Dennis Schroeder, 15 and 8 for Gallinari on 25%, while Schroeder had 14 points with only three assists, no rebounds or steals on 39% shooting. Nerlens Noel picked up uh, three fouls in about 90 seconds in the first half, so he only played eight minutes total. So if you want steals and blocks, Noel's still a guy to roster, but he's not for everybody. We're well aware of that. Um, Chrissy Paul had 31, 2 and 7, which is great, obviously. And Gilgis Alexander, 17 and 5. It was also a good Stephen Adams game. He played 32 minutes, got the extra playing time with Noel in foul trouble. It also meant Mike Muscala got into the game. So those Muscala minutes aren't really because Basley was out. It's more because Noel had foul trouble. Four steals and a block also for Adams. But really, that's not him imparting himself or impacting himself massively on the game. And he still continues to really, really struggle this season. Let's go on to the next game, the New Orleans Pelicans and the Portland Trailblazers. The Pelicans win comfortably, 138 to 117. Hassan Whiteside really struggled to try and guard Zion Williamson. I don't think you have the facilities for that big man. 17 and 14 for Whiteside in 27 minutes as this team got trucked. Well, Trevor Ariza. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. He goes from 20 points down to 7 points without even blinking an eye, but he got 3 steals, and we roster him for his steals. He actually didn't miss a shot. He just didn't take any, a 4% usage rate. McCullum had 20 points on poor efficiency, while Lillard had 20, 5, and 6, and his efficiency dropped off here as well, while Carmelo Anthony, 18, 1, and 1. Shout out to Jordan Clarkson. Mallow's numbers have dropped off a lot. He is the 130th ranked player over the course of the season, but 161st over his last 20 games. He's a clear 10-team drop to me, and he's really close to it in a 12-teamer, depending on who is around. Gary Trent. No! who had been playing well. I think he's significantly over-rostered, but four points only in 27 minutes. He was a nice three-point streamer, point streamer, but by he's no, not even close to being a 12-team must-roster, while Anthony Simons returned from his concussion 9-2-4. and four. For the Pelicans, let's go to Zion. 28 minutes, 31-9, and nine, five assists, one steal. The thing that's holding him back from being a top 10 player next season, yes, next season, are defensive numbers and free throw percentage. But he got to the line 14 times here and hit 11 of them. If you give me 79%, Zion, you are a top 10 guy and you can get those defensive numbers. He is almost unstoppable already offensively. He is the number one dynasty prospect. Sorry, 1B behind Doncic, I'd say is 1A. Um, he is going to be awesome. And I get this question all the time, Josh, what's his dynasty value? It is top one. That is his That is his upside value. He will be a first rounder next season in a lot of drafts. He is a monster. No Brandon Ingram, so the hitman Josh Hart started again. Really strong uh, third quarter. 17 and 6 in 26, while Drew Holiday 16, 4 and 10. Two steals, two blocks. The panic is there. Uh, hopefully that uh, assuaged your concerns. Well, uh, JJ Reddick had 20 in 21 minutes, and Derek Favors 6 and 7 in 21 minutes there, too. A lot of Nicole or Melly playing time. I just don't understand why we're getting that much Melly. 28 minutes. Favors is probably an eight team drop. Uh, I'd still hold in 12s and 10. He tens. he's on the borderline. Um, Lonzo, 9, 6, and 10, a triple one. Some poor shot selection from um, Ball in this game, but still relatively strong performance, and he remains um, a top 60 guy over the course of this season. Then on to the last game of the night. The Boston Celtics go down to the Rockets, 105-116. Jalen Brown with those uh, sore ankles. He was able to play through that. 
But then he did end up, it looked like you're tweaking his calf at the end of that game. Brown had 19 points with four triples, a steal, and a block. So that's pretty good production. While Gordy Hayward, 28 and 6. Vanilla Tice, 29 minutes, 11 and 9. It was obviously not the matchup for Ennis Cantor, who played only eight minutes and is still significantly over rostered Cantor. Should not be on a 12 team league roster, in my opinion. Jason Tatum, 15 and 9, but the four steals and a blocker are really interesting, although the shooting was poor. And Smart had 8, 5, and 4. Again, probably still a 12 teamer. With everyone starting to get healthy. Grant Williams, Shemi Ojale, their minutes dropped way off. For the Rockets, Jimmy Harden, 42, 8, and 7 with seven threes, while Rusty Westbrook had 36 and 10, five assists and two steals. And this small ball pocket rocket lineup is really helping Westbrook. It just enables him to attack the hoop with all these shooters around him, and it's working fantastically. And it's great to see his free throw percentage back up. Well, how about Bob Covington? What a line this is. 12 and 7, two triples, three steals, four blocks, and it came with 27% shooting. So that jumps back up. That could have been an absolute monster. I think Covington's a top 30 player the rest of the way. I think he could be a top 15 guy legitimately. And the fact that uh, Ryan Saunders would play him 28, 30 minutes a night, obviously nothing to do with his knee. Saunders just thought he had to get other shit kickers in there ahead of him. It's almost grounds for being fired. Like this team could not win a game, the Timberwolves. They've you know, lost so many games. And we had a player like Covington just sitting and playing like 30 minutes like he's some spud. Like he's, you know, let's pick a name out of thin air and say like he's in his cancer. Like he's not. He's really, really good. And that was, especially for a team that wanted to play more Houston Rockets type ball, the fact that they were so keen to get rid of Covington and then wouldn't play him is disastrous. Anyway, enough of Minnesota. Dan House, 40 minutes, 17 and 9 with three chills. I'll be selling the absolute shit out of House. Eric Gordon has to come back, right? So Macklemore played 18 minutes. Austin Rivers played 20 minutes. You're not going to move both of those guys out of the rotation to get Gordon back. So there is going to be a reduction in House's playing time. Now, whether that's down to 26 minutes or down to 30 minutes or whatever it is, he, he's not going to have this level of production. He's been pretty good recently. He's not a top 100 upside player, I don't think, House. He's fine for 14 team leaguers. But a lot of people do really believe in him as some sort of game changer for their fantasy team. Maybe I'm wrong with this. Maybe they do just play him 34 minutes a night and then Macklemore is out of the rotation entirely. I don't think they'll do that. Maybe they do. I just don't think House's upside is enough to completely gamble on that and think, well, this is the absolute jewel that I have to have on my team. Rivers was bad here. Uh, Macklemore was pretty poor as well. Three points in his 18 minutes. While PJ Tucker, again, couldn't stress this enough, not a 12-team league guy. Four and six. Had his two steals. He's a steals specialist. Chris Dunn. Those sort of players, if you're looking for steals, like that's what Tucker provides, but in no way is he a must-roster 12-team league player. Let's look at some injury news now. Uh, Rashawn Holmes, uh, just absolutely stupid stuff from the Kings. I talked about this on the mini-show earlier today, but now they've announced he has a labral tear and he'll be reevaluated in two to three weeks. So we're looking at maybe a March return for Holmes. That's not a return in two to three weeks. That's a reevaluation For a bloke that was apparently healed and then didn't play due to an illness, um, it's been weeks and weeks and weeks for Holmes. And if you don't have an injured reserve slot, it is pretty tough to keep him. Uh, there's a real chance we don't even see him play this season, along with Marvin Bagley. It's really rough. I don't know what the Kings will do because Alex Len's going to come back. Is he going to play those center minutes? I see a lot of people asking, hey, do I add Jabari Parker? The answer to that is almost definitely no. Nemanja Bielitsa will play those minutes over Parker. And yes, they can push Bielitsa over to play at the five. And then Parker gets some minutes, but I'd need Jabari to play 30 minutes and I'd need him to be pretty high usage. And he's not being high usage with Heald, with Bogdanovich, with Barnes, with Fox. Like he's just not getting that level of production. And like I've said so many times with Miami during the season, try and look at 240 minutes for a Kings team, even without Holmes and Bagley, and see how you can get enough minutes for Parker to be a factor. It's really tough. It means eliminating Bazemore out of the rotation entirely or Corey Joseph playing 10 minutes, Harry Giles not playing at all. It's really tough to get enough minutes there for Parker for him to have any sort of 12-team league value. Kevin Love and Achilles Saunas, that is always a really scary sign. So go on, if, in this short term, if, if Love's going to miss time, which I reckon he will, Larry Nance, just go and add him and let's see what goes on there because hopefully they just play Nance for 30 minutes or else they'll do some other bullshit and play Alfonso McKinney 30 minutes and really yeah, limit Nance. But the fact that this Achilles Saunas has cropped up, whether it's real or not, means that Nance is back on the radar. While uh, Dan Gafford, I talked about this earlier, apparently his ankle is still sore or maybe it's not sore or he's inferior to Chris Felicio or their coach is an absolute so dickhead, either one of those things, or maybe all of those things are true. While Jalen Brown, as I said, just hurt his calf. At the end of that game, the Celtics have one more game left this week. I wouldn't be shocked to see Brown sit that one out. 
We've got 11 games for Wednesday, so we're going to talk about that for DFS. Of course, we are looking at DraftKings pricings for these games. All right, the first game we take a look at, the Detroit Pistons and the Orlando Magic. In Orlando, the Magic are 7.5 point favorites. The total is 205.5, but the Pistons are likely to receive the uh, the services of Sphere McKayluk and Derek Rose coming back. So how this rotation looks is going to be really, really interesting. At point guard, DraftKings pricing here, of course. At uh, point guard, Markel Fultz, 5,900. I think the upside's a little bit low for Fultz, but I actually like his cash value. He's returning about 30 a game over the last three, which at that price is fine. The Pistons have been a bit of a negative against point guards, but recently that has uh, jumped up somewhat. While Derek Rose at 6,400, I would not want to use him in his first game back. Carter Williams, no thank you. And Reggie Jackson's at 6,300 again. With Rose coming back, that complicates the issue uh, pretty significantly. The Shark, Bruce Brown's been putting up some good numbers, but Svee and Rose returning is going to significantly eat into his playing time. So I'm not spending 5,500 there. Terry Ross is at 51. I like that. Ross is getting his shots up. Um, yeah, he can have the stinker occasionally, but he is averaging 28 over the last five, which is pretty strong numbers there from Rossi. I think that works in his favor. Fournier at 6,000. I'd take Ross at 51 over him and save that extra cash. Your small forwards, Jimmy Ennis is at 3,000. He was okay in his Magic debut, but still nothing that overly excites me there. While Aaron Gordon's at 6,900. Giggity. And he's been putting up, generally, some pretty good numbers. And at 6,900, I think there is uh, appeal there for Gordo. I don't mind it. I think there is cash and tournament value in him. A Wundu, Tony Snell, no thank you. For your big men, Nikola Vucevic, $9,000. Now, the Pistons have been a team that, that opposition centers have been able to attack with Andre Drummond there. Of course, he's not there, so we don't really know how that's going to work. At 9,000, though, I think Vooch is a good play. While the crucifix Christian Wood got uh, caseyed in the last game, only 21 points in 23 minutes. He's at 7,100, and the matchup's positive for Woody. I'd be inclined to use him, but more tournaments, especially with Henson and with Morris and with uh, Thon McCare in that rotation. Um, Mo Bumba, Markeith Morris, the Muppet John Henson. Henson at 3,700, it's actually not bad cash value. Maybe he can get you 20 points, 22 points uh, in that sort of a role, which is okay if you're just looking for a cheap option there, because we know that he's going to play at least some sort of a role for this squad. Next game, the Atlanta Hawks. They take on the Cleveland Cavaliers. The Hawks on the road are two-point favorites because the Cavs stink. The total is 232.5. DeAndre Bembry is questionable still, while DeAndre Hunter is probable, while Kevin Love has popped up on the injury report as questionable with Achilles soreness. You know how I feel about Achilles soreness. If anyone pops up on the injury report, they should absolutely be sat down. There is absolutely no reason for the Cavs to pay, play Love, so I would assume that he does not play. So it's time to fire up your Larry Nances. Unless they go stupid and play Drummond and Thompson together. But it is time to fire up your Larry Nances. At point guard, Darius Garland is at 4,700. I don't like that at all. While the Padawan Colin Sexton at 62 should get some usage funneled his way with Love most likely sitting out. So I think there is something there for him. It's not the greatest play. Trey Young at 10-4 is always pretty good, especially when you go up a tasty-ass backcourt. Go up. You don't go up it. You go up against a tasty-ass backcourt like the Cleveland Cavaliers. Young should be a 50-plus point guy. I like him quite a bit here. Uh, Dante Exum, I don't. At shooting guard, Kevin Porter's at 43. I like that one uh, significantly as well. He had 29 points in 28 minutes in the last game. Really starting to look yeah, pretty significant in terms of what his role is as we move forward. So I like him there. Cam Reddish at 42, we can do better. While Fanta Pants, Kevin Herter at 6,200, I think is too high of a price for Herter. Bembry, no. At small forward, you've got Osman at 41. That's a strong no from me. DeAndre Hunter's at 44, who he puts up lines and you go, that looks okay, but the lack of peripherals does limit his overall ceiling. Now, he did have 30 points in the first game against the Cavs this season, and that's okay. I think he's a tournament guy, but even then, a pretty soft target. Um, of course, for your big men, Drummo's at 9,400, the big avocado. You have to love that one. While Capella is out for the Hawks, so the Undertaker, Dwayne Dedman at 47, looks like an absolute lock to me. Damo Jones will start, and I don't care for that. While the Baptist, John Collins at 91, that's probably pushing a little bit too high there for Johnny, but the, the matchup does work. We're not using Tristan Thompson, but Larry Nance all the way down at 51. That looks entirely appetizing, especially under the assumption that Love is just not going to suit up, and I, I really can't see why he would. Next game, the Toronto Raptors, the Brooklyn Nets. Serge Ibaka missed last game due to an illness. He's questionable for this one, while Kyrie Irving remains sidelined, as does Norm Powell 
and Marcus Gasol. Will we get uh, Rondé Hollis Jefferson at center again? Because that's what happened in that first game. Or will we get more Waterboy? Uh, Chris Boucher, I, I think they'll probably go back to Rondé. It works so well. At point guard, Dinwiddie's at 7,800. Love it. Absolutely love that one for Spence. While Karis Levert's at 6,600. Really shit the bed last time. 22 points. And some of that hot play and hot shooting wasn't able to carry over. I think he's more of a tournament guy. While Lowry's at 79. And Kyle Lowry is banging in. 53-point average over the last three games. That is obviously really good. The matchup here is a good one for Lowry. I think at 79, we feel okay about it, especially if Ibaka is sidelined. Van Vliet's at 76. That's a no. Terrence Davis at 46 is too high also. Uh, Joe Harris at 49 is a shooting guard. Not a bad cash floor guy. A pretty limited upside player, though. While we go to the small forwards, and you've got blokes like Timotei Lawawu Cabro and the Jedi Oji Ananobi. Hello there. Now, Ananobi's price has gone up to 5,200 because he dropped 55 points last game. Now, if a Barker is out, I think that does help OG, but he shot like 65% and had a double-digit rebound game and blocked and steeled and did everything, which he just is not consistently able to do. So he's only a tournament guy, and that elevated salary doesn't make it appealing. As for a Barker, if he plays at 6,300, I could not like that more. That is an absolutely strong play. While Boucher at 34, only for tournaments. Jordan playing over Jared Allen at the moment. He's at 5,500 and he's averaging 31. So that looks to me to be a bit of a no-brainer. Of course, they could change that rotate rotation up, which gives you a little bit of skepticism. But with the way he's going at the moment, and the way the minutes are going in his favor uh, are, is obviously uh, encouraging. Jarrett Allen's a no, while Pascal Siakam's at 8,700, probably pushing a little bit too high there for Pask, who's averaging under 40 in his last five. As for Hollis Jefferson at 4,400, if we do hear that Abarka's out, I do like Rondé. He probably won't um, respond or perform the exact same way that he did last game, where he had 36 points, but he was obviously really impressive in that contest starting at center. The Milwaukee Bucks... And the Indiana Pacers. Um, pretty good matchup here. Um, no spread or total out at this point. Now, the Bucks have obviously been crushing people and the Pacers are struggling. Can they hold on here, Indiana, and at least keep it close? That's what we're hoping. But one thing that is in their favor is that Yanni Antetokounmpo is out again for paternity leave. That's going to boost the value of guys like Middleton and Bledsoe. At point guard, Oladipo's at 48. I'd only want to use him in tournaments. He's just unreliable at this point. Well, the big ragu, Dante DiVincenzo, is not going to work for me. I love Bledsoe at 77. Strong. Brogdon's at 67 against his former team. He had 30 in the matchup earlier in the season, and he's a little bit down with his shooting, as I detailed earlier today on the Buy Low podcast. I think that that is not the strongest one that I'd want to look for here. Uh, shooting guard, Jeremy Lamb. No, thank you. Paddy Connaughton. Where's Matthews? Sterling Brown. Now, Brownie had 29 points at 3,500, which is really, really good. Obviously, um, in the absence of Antetokounmpo, can he replicate that? I'm going to have to say probably not, but he's at least in your tournament pool. And then you go into small forwards. Justin Holiday's a no. Tony Warren's at 56. I like the floor. That's a really good cash play. Well, 8,800 for Chris Middleton with Noah Yarny. That looks to me like he's a 45-point-ish sort of a player. Dougie McDirt, no thanks. At center, Miles Turner's at 51. Now, Turner averages amazingly 42 points against the Bucs, and the Bucs have been one of the best teams for opposing centers to put up numbers against uh, this season and recently. So Turner, I like as a tournament guy. Lopez at 58 looks strong for both formats of the game. And then you go to DeMontis Sabonis at 9,800, which is a really, really high price. I am not 100% convinced at that Sabonis is a consistent 50-point guy. So therefore, I'd probably fade off of him in this one. The next game up <clears throat> is the Washington Wizards and the New York Knicks. The Wizards are on a back-to-back uh, -back after beating the Bulls. The Knicks here are two-and-a-half-point favorites, and the total is 228.5. The tank, Tom Bryant, won't play for the Wizards. While Mo Harkless, Alonzo Trier, and Mitchie Robinson are all probable with an illness, and Damian Dotson also, sorry, is probable at point guard. Rowan Barrett Jr. is at 4,500. He has been nothing short of terrible since returning from the ankle injury, just for tournaments, though, because that price is so low. While Ish Smith's at 48. I think Ish at 48 is not a bad cash play. Napier is actually putting up numbers, but he's playing low minutes, so he's hard to, to utilize there. While Alfred Payton is up to 7,500, and you know if there's a good matchup, it is against the Washington Wizards. So 7,500 for Payton. It is on the high side, but it's not one to completely write off. Nilakina, you can write that off as much as you want. 
at shooting guard, the Duke Wayne Ellington's at 3,200. He's giving us 22 or 23 a night. I don't see his role changing in this one, so I like that as a cash play. Limited upside for Ellington, but the way that he's going, it's it's pretty strong. While Beal is at 9,600. Beal's good for 45 almost every night, probably 50. The matchup and the back-to-back is a factor here for Beelow, so I'd probably not be all that keen on him. Uh, Reggie Bullock at 42. Again, like Allington, strong floor value for cash. While um, uh, the other guy who's going to talk about, yeah, Troy Brown, absolutely disastrous at the moment what Brown is doing, so I'm not keen on him. The fourth, Kevin Knox, he is averaging, I'll give you a few seconds to guess, eight points over the last five games. So yeah, that's, uh, that's a pretty good no. At centre, Mitch Robinson. And Mitch Robinson says, I'll take it from here. Let's bloody hope so. He had 42 points in the double double overtime game against the Hawks. He played 35 minutes, and that is the key. Will Miller play him those minutes, or will he try and develop Taj Gibson to see what that guy can give him for the future? That's a big question. But Robinson is a good GPP guy, because we know the the numbers can be there. Well, Julius um, Julius, uh, Spin Move Randall at 8,600 is putting up good numbers, and I really, really like him in a good matchup, and considering how much they just say, just do whatever you want, screw the rest of the team. At Bertans, 5,800. No, that's too high. While Punch Bob's at 3,900. Or Rui Hachimura. Big game from Rui on Tuesday. He's at 5,100. I actually like that quite a bit. While Flaming Mo Wagner, uh, 45, is more of a a tournament guy. Mihinmi and Gibson in the anti-tournaments. I think we need to look at those guys. The next game... It is the Charlotte Hornets. It is the Minnesota Timberwolves. The Wolves are seven and a half point favorites, and the total here is 226 points. Um, we know that Cody Martin is out with a concussion, so that's going to help guys like Kayla Barton, like Jalen McDaniels, uh, like Paul Washington Jr. as well. At point guard, D'Angelo Russell's all the way up to 8,300. It's probably a little bit too high for D'Lo, to be honest. So I'd probably only look at him as a tournament. Rogier is struggling, but at 6,100, there is marginal appeal. Malik Monk at 47. Love what he's doing. Love the minutes. There's cash value. Probably not tournament upside. While 7,400 for Devontae Graham. He's going to shoot poorly. That's an absolute guarantee. But he is averaging 45 over the last three. So enough floor value there. Jarrett Culver at 39. Let's If you want to get sexy, if you want to get wild, if you want to just... You know, throw your money away and piss on it at the same time. Uh, maybe you could try that. But to be fair to Colby, he did have 23 in 21 minutes last game, which at 3,900 would actually equate a win. So I don't completely dislike him. Um, for your shooting guards, Malik Beasley's at 47. I really like that. Good cash floor value. Probably not the upside there with Russell playing, but good cash value. While Caleb Martin's at minimum salary, yeah, hard to get excited about that bloke. Uh, Akogi, not going to do it for me either. At small forward, Miles Bridges is at 6,200. It's pushing probably a little bit too high. It's not bad. I think the floor value is there for Bridges, but I don't know how much better than that he can get. While onto your big man spots, Jim Johnson's at 3,500. He's closing games for the Wolves. The matchup's okay. I think he's all right. I think he's a 20-plus point guy here, which would give great value at 3,500. Paul Washington's at 44. I think he's worth a look, especially for a tournament. One show Hernan Gomez at 39. A cash play with limited upside. Uh, Townsie's at 10-5. Just smash the shit out of that because the the, uh, Hornets can't defend big men. Uh, Cody Zeller, Bill Hernan Gomez. They're not the guys that are going to do it. Hernan Gomez versus Hernan Gomez in this one. Next game, we take a look at the Portland Trailblazers. And the Memphis Grizzlies, the Grizz, are four and a half point favorites. The Blazers on a back-to-back. The total, 235.5. So a pretty big total happening in this one. The wave pool, D'Anthony Melton's at 41. Just cannot hit a shot at all at the moment, and the numbers are way down. I wouldn't be interested in using him. McCollum's at 68, really just for tournaments, while Ja Morant at 75. Actually, think that, that looks pretty good, and, and point guards have had good numbers against the Blazers this year. It is high, though, for Morant. It's jumped up quite a bit, and that gives me a level of pause there. Lillard at 10-2 looks to me to be a guy that's going to get 50 almost every night, while Tyus Jones is not uh, not in a good enough position for me to care about. Dylan Brooks is been, has been struggling, averaging under 20 points in his last three. He's at 55. That's probably too high, while Kyle Anderson at 45 is a low upside player, but also has some uh, cash value in his role as the starting small forward, while Gary Trent's at 48. No! Love what Trent has been doing. High 20s in minutes, getting steals, scoring, hitting threes in general in most games. Um, I don't feel super confident about him here. For your bigs, Jaron Jackson's at 64. Love the tournament value. While Hassan Whiteside at 84. The world. Matchup's a good one for him, and matchup's a good one for his opponent, Jonas Valanciunas. So I think both of those players are in play here. Mallow's at 55. I don't care for that. Brandon Clark, not enough value in him either. 
Let us go on to the next game. We're looking at the Sacramento Kings, the Dallas Mavericks. Luka Doncic is likely to be returning for Dallas, while DeLon Wright is probable. Rishon Holmes, of course, the injury news on him wasn't good. He is out again. Bagley is out, while Jabari Parker is questionable. Again, I don't think Jabari is coming in and playing a big role. At point guard, Darren Fox is at 7,700. Yep, absolutely fine with that. Looks like a pretty good play to me. While Doncic is at 10,9, I'd probably fade off him in his first game back. Delon and Corey Joseph, uh, JJ Barea, the burner, Jalen Brunson, no interest. At shooting guard, Bogdan's at 5,100. Not a bad cash play. We know the minutes are there. We know he's going to start, but the upside seems a little bit limited for him, while Bud Heald's at 65. Again, I'd take Bogdan over Heald because it's a $1,400 price difference, and Heald can be a little bit fluctuating in his value. Well, Timmy Hardaway dropped 46 last game. Awesome. Just not enough consistency in that. Bazemore, Seth Curry. With Doncic coming back for, for Curry, especially harder to use him. At small forward, the pencil Harrison Barnes. Barnesy. Actually averaging 31 points over the last three. Can he do it again against his former team? That price is not restrictive. So I th- do think there is some tournament value in him. Finney Smith, I'm not all that keen on. And then for your big men, Nemanja Bielitsis at 63. Love it for cash. Bit of tournament value there. While Kristas Porzingis, he's at 8,200. With Doncic back, his usage is going to fall. And I think that price might be a little bit too high for KP. Harry Giles probably gets another start at center. And if he gives you 21 or 22 points at 3,700, that's absolutely fine if you're looking for that short, that cheap price guy to try and plug in around some expensive guys. While Kleber and Corley Stein probably not going to have any sort of impact at all in this one. Next up, the Miami Heat and the Utah Jazz. The Jazz are four and a half point favorites. Now, last game, Mike Conley was out due to rest, and now he's popped up again on the injury report due to an illness. So that is obviously something that we're going to need to pay attention to because if he is out, it boosts the value of Don Mitchell, it boosts the value of Gobert, it boosts the value of Boyan, it boosts the value of Jordan Clarkson as well. A big swing sort of piece here in this matchup. At point guard, Conley is at 57, and I'd absolutely love that if we knew he is going to play, which is don't. Well, the Don Donovan Mitchell's at 73. He's gone. He's good. Um, again, I would be more into that if we do hear that Conley is out. Dragic is at 5,700. With Butler playing, he's a little bit harder to use. While Jimmy is at 8,000. Because he's my butler. Um, a 40-plus guy. I think that's absolutely reasonable. Jordy Clarkson at 53. Smashing it if, if uh, Conley's out. Can be a bit risky. Probably moves just to tournaments if we do hear that Mike is playing. Kendrick Nunn has been pretty poor, averaging just 20 points in his last five games. He's at 5,100. I would not want to spend that. Joe Ingles is at 48. Only keen if Conley is out. Uh, Dunk Robinson's at 5,000. Yeah, some okay games from him, but I'm not super into it. Igadala similarly. At small forward, Boyan's at 61. Really strong cash play for Boyan. Probably limited upside, but strong for cash. O'Neal not really doing anything. Well, Jay Crowder been unbelievable in his start to his Miami Heat career. He's at 5,100. I think there's a chance he plays 30 minutes again. Do I think that he can get to that 30-point uh, you know, mark? Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. Considering he's had a couple of good games in a row, you've got a feeling a shit one's going to come. It is against his former team, so we'll see how he goes, but I have putting little faith there. I'm not putting any faith in Derek Jones either. At centre, Rudy Gobert. Rudy Gobert. Rudy Gobert. I think for Gobert here, we have to look at him uh, especially more favorably if Conley is out. Otherwise, I still think it's a pretty good option against the Heat. While Bam Adebayo is at 7,800. He has struggled against Gobert in the past, but his recent form, his lowest score Adebayo in his last five is 41 points. And that is obviously really strong at a 7,800 price tag. So I do think Bam's an option. Bam, 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 Bam. Kelly Linick dropped 42 points last game in a bench roll uh, behind Adebayo. That is one that we don't think is all that replicable. And I wouldn't want to fall into the trap of relying upon Kelly Olynyk because that does not generally work in your favor. The next game is the Golden State Warriors. It's the Phoenix Sun. Sharich is out. Baines is out. DeAndre Ayton is questionable again, while Kavon Looney with that troublesome hip is back on the injury report, which is obviously shit news for him and really for his future. The fact that he can't get over this shit is really, really bad. Ravishing Rick Rubio is at 5,900. I like the matchup a lot for Rubes, so I do think that is in play. While Devin Booker has been struggling a bit, averaging only 34 points over his last five. And at 8,400, you need a lot more. His last three games against Golden State have uh, yielded 53 points. A perfect opportunity for him to get back on track. 
Javon Carter, no thanks. The lubricant Kai Bowman, he started last game, had eight points in 15 minutes with Draymond back. So hard to get excited there when they're going to run Wiggins and Draymond a lot at point guard. So I'm not interested in Bowman. Okobo, Jeremy Pargo, Zach Norvell, no, no, no. At shooting guard, Wiggins is at 76, eh, only for tournaments, really. Damian Lee fired up last game. Again, more tournaments. I don't have that much trust in him. And Jordy Poole at 39. I actually think Poole can get 20 most nights. And at 3,900, that's not a bad floor value to get into. McCall Bridges at 53, absolutely crushing at the moment, averaging 30 over his last five. There's always a risk that something just doesn't happen offensively, but they seem to be leaning on him more. I also expect Phoenix to be starting Kelly Oubre once again, so that could have an impact on McCall. I'm not super into him here. Pascal, the triangle, no thank you at 4,500. Well, Juan Toscano Alexander, oh, Alexander Anderson. I just wanted to say his name, and then I said it wrong. For your Ubres, for your small forward, 7,200 for Kelly. I think a big bounce back could come here. I like him a bit. Cam Johnson, I don't. Um, and uh, onto your big men. You have got Aiton at 92. Look, if Aiton plays, I, I think he smashes that. As for Marquise Chris at 59, absolute smash value for him as well. Uh, really putting up big numbers is uh, is Chrissy, and he could see that push into the 32-33 minute mark, which would maybe push him to 40 points, which would be excellent. I, I really like Marquise Chris at 5,900, while if Aiton is out, check Diallo at 5,000. Could be a good play. He had 26 points last time, and at 5,000, that would work in your favor. I think he becomes a, a cash guy with some tournament upside as well. The last game we look at, the Lakers and the Nuggets. Anthony Davis, of course, Mr. Probable. He is back on the injury report as being probable. He's had probable designations with his ass, with his shoulder, with his finger in pretty much every game this season. At point guard, the Blue Arrow, Jamal Murray, $7,000. He's been unstoppable since spraining his ankle. He's claiming it hurts and he's at risk of missing games. And that's always making it hard to use him. But he is just torching blokes at the moment. Hard to go against him, but I, but I think I will here. Uh, LeBron's at 10-6. LeBron James. Just quietly, he's only averaging 48 over the last three, which isn't quite enough. Um, I think the matchup's okay, but I'm, I'm not super sold on LeBron, considering he's only averaging 43 against the Nuggets last three times out. Rajon Rondo dropped 41 for the Lakers last time. I am not buying into that. Doja and Morris and Caruso, no thanks. But again, Barton is out for this team, as is Mick Porter for the Denver Nuggets, opening up some of those bench minutes. Tory Craig's at 4,000. I don't really have any interest in that. KCP, Gaz Harris, Avery Bradley, Jordy McRae, no. Um, small forwards, Dan Green, also no. While the future MVP, Cole Kuzma, is at 4,800. Had a pretty strong game last time, Kuz. I just don't really want to trust that all that much. The big men's where it's at because Tone Davis is at 10,000. Really like that one. Jeremy Grant at 43. That salary continues to plummet because his production is in the toilet, averaging just 23 over the last three. And with Millsap's minutes maybe going up, that's going to have an impact on Granny as well. Uh, big Chungus is at 10-1. Nikola Jokic, love that one too. While Howard and McGee are pretty tough to get behind with the way that the Lakers rotation and their level of production has been going of late. Let's have a look now at how it all looks on Fangio. Some value guys there. Rubio and D'Angelo Russell. I love Russell at 76 on Fangio. RJ Barrett, Wancho, Mallow, Ibaka, Townsy, Morant, Bledsoe, the Padawan, Colin Sexton, Kelly Oubre, and uh, Gobert and Drummond come in as options over on Fangio. Guys, that'll wrap it up for me today. Subscribe, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on YouTube. Give me a review, leave a comment, give it a thumbs up. Those ways are all fantastic ways of supporting the show, guys. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. OG Ananobi. Hello there.